Hello. Welcome to this week's message from Emmanuel, part of a series on Israel's wanderings in the wilderness, from slavery to sonship. This week we're going to be looking at a little story tucked away in Numbers chapter 21. It's only six verses long, so let's read it together. Numbers 21 verses 4 to 9. Then the people of Israel set out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with the long journey, and they began to speak against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? they complained. There's nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord told him, Make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten by a snake will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze and attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. If there's one characteristic that marks out the people of God and their wanderings in the wilderness, it's a habit of grumbling and complaining against God and against their leader, Moses. Before this story happens in Numbers 21, if we read through Exodus and Numbers, we find no less than seven occasions when the people of God let loose with grumbling and complaining. In Exodus 15, just after the Red Sea crossing, at the bitter waters of Marah, they complain. In the wilderness of Zin, in chapter 16, They complain about lack of food. At Rephidim, where there was no water to drink, they complain again. At Mount Sinai, when Moses had been gone for a long time, they complain that he's been gone too long and they need other gods to look after them. Three days after leaving Sinai, in Numbers 11, they're craving better food. They're dissatisfied with the food they have. In Numbers 13 to 14, at the edge of the promised land, they're complaining about the giants in the land and their fortified cities that there's no way they're going to be able to conquer them and they'll end up being killed instead. And at Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin in Numbers 20, they're complaining again that there's no food to eat. Now, grumbling and complaining can often seem like a small thing, a trivial thing, compared to such enormous things as murder and adultery. But it's quite clear from God's word that grumbling and complaining are actually quite a serious issue, more than we realise. Jesus says in Matthew 12 that the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. When God's reminding his people about their journey in the wilderness in Deuteronomy 8, He says that he did this to humble you and find out what was in your heart and see if you would be willing to obey him. The condition of Israel's heart was the real issue. Despite everything that God had done for them, they were choosing to dwell on the hardships that they faced rather than the goodness of their God. Their speech showed an ungrateful and unbelieving attitude. There were three things wrong with this. First of all, they didn't believe God's sworn promise to them. God had promised on oath to bring them into the land. They doubted God's character. In Exodus 33, God revealed himself to Moses as gracious, compassionate, slow to be angry, abounding in steadfast loving kindness and truth showing mercy to thousands. But the God that Israel was believing in at this point was a vindictive and sadistic God who wanted to kill them in the wilderness, 
who wasn't able to bring them into the promised land. Totally different to God's revealed character. And they forgot to give thanks and be appreciative of all the good things God had already done for them in setting them free, in putting an end to their slave masters at the Red Sea, in guiding them day and night with a pillar of cloud and fire, providing them with manna from heaven and water from solid rock. James 3 warns us about the power of the tongue. A whole forest can be set ablaze, says James, by a single spark. In the same way, one comment can ruin someone's reputation. Careless words can kill faith and joy and life in other people. They can bring discouragement, disharmony, disunity. Words carry power. And the result of this, in the Numbers 21 story, is that we see God choosing to remove some of his protection over them. Remember that they've been travelling now for over a year in the desert, and the desert's a notorious place for snakes to live. But up to this point, there have been no recorded incidents of snake bites. But now, God chooses to remove some of that protection in order that the Israelites might realise just how much he's been protecting them to this point. We don't know exactly what kind of snakes they might have been. One possibility is that they were something called the carpet viper or sore-scaled viper, which is highly poisonous, has a fiery red colour and always strikes to bite. Three soldiers in 1918 crossing this area of the desert were attacked and all three died. It was a certain sentence of death to be bitten by one of these snakes. No anti-venom treatments were available back then. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul points out that these things were written for us as warnings and examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as the people of Israel did. In this passage, God is warning us that an attitude of ingratitude and unbelief is serious and could be spiritually fatal. God's desire for us is to cultivate a different habit, to replace it, a habit of thanksgiving and thankfulness. In Psalm 103, David shows us this kind of attitude. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not treat us harshly as we deserve, for his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him, for he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. Our days on earth are like grass, like wild flowers we bloom and die. The wind blows and we're gone as though we had never been here. But the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him, with those 
His salvation extends to the children's children of those who are faithful to his covenant, of those who obey his commandments. This attitude of thanksgiving is key to a healthy spiritual life. And God wants us to learn the lesson that he was trying to teach his people in the wilderness. So let's move on from that part of the story to God's merciful cure. At last the people admit that they've sinned. They realize they've been complaining against God and Moses and that was wrong. They admit it and their admission opens the way for God to be able to provide his remedy. But it's a most unusual remedy. Far from giving them some kind of potion to drink or asking them to make some kind of sacrifice or do some kind of noble deed, all God says to Moses is make a bronze replica of a poisonous snake, attach it to a pole and ask people to look at it. Nothing else. Just look at it and they'll be healed. And the people do. And from that point on, no one bitten by a snake will die. But what does it mean? What was God trying to tell his people all those centuries ago? And what relevance does it have for you today in 2021? Centuries after this story, Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Nicodemus is an important man. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, 71 men whose job was to judge criminal cases and also to make rulings about matters to do with the temple, worship and rituals by by Israel's people. They needed to know the law inside out. They were learned people and holy people. Nicodemus is aware that Jesus is special, that God is with him because he's doing miracles, the kind of which they haven't seen before. And so he comes to Jesus to ask about him. And Jesus's answer is unusual. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Or it could read, unless he is born from above. Nicodemus can't figure this out. He says, But a grown man can't go back inside his mother and be born a second time. So Jesus says, this is how it is. Human physical life can only reproduce human physical life. You need God's spirit to produce spiritual life. He says, you're a great teacher in Israel and you don't understand this. The wind blows where it wants to. No one can see where it's come from or where it's going, but you can feel the effects of it. This is how it is when someone is born by God's Spirit. But Nicodemus still can't understand it. How can this be possible? Jesus gives him a word picture to help him understand. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. You see, just as the people of Israel in the desert were being killed by the venom of the snakes, so the whole human race is under sentence of death from a far more deadly poison than that, the poison of sin. In Genesis 3 verse 6, Adam made a choice to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God had said, on the day you eat that, you will certainly die. Adam chose to eat that fruit and in that moment, as Romans 5.12 tells us, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death and in this way death spread to everyone because everyone sinned. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20 bears this out. There isn't a person on earth who always does right and never sins. 
And so death becomes the norm for humanity. We were never intended to die, but that came to the human race because of the disobedience of Adam, which was then passed on to every human being alive. And what does that do to us? Paul brilliantly describes the effects in Romans chapter 7. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I'm not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another law within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Our sinful nature imprisons us in desires that fight against God. And those desires lead us to act in ways that sentence us to spiritual death. They cut us off from the life and the presence of God, which Adam originally knew. He could walk and talk with God as a friend. But we can't because our sins have separated us from him. But the good news is that God has provided a wonderful cure for this poison of sin. As Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, the Son of Man must be lifted up, said Jesus. When Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about this, he was in the first year of his ministry on earth. Two years later, he would be betrayed, arrested, unjustly tried, because he had never committed a crime and no one had heard a lie come from his lips, and he would be led away to a Roman execution the worst kind possible. But on that execution tree, Jesus took into his body the whole sin of the human race. How do we know this? 1 Peter 1.24 tells us, He himself personally carried our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. And linking back to last week's message, he goes on to say, by his wounds, we are healed. Then Paul says the same thing in 2 Corinthians 5, 12. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, the bronze snake Moses made looked like the thing that was killing the people of Israel. In the same way, when Jesus hung on the cross, he became the embodiment of the very sin that is killing all of us. But here's the thing. Just as every Israelite bitten by a snake could look at that snake image and live, so Anyone who looks at the crucified Jesus and believes that he didn't just do it for everyone generally, but for them personally, that person can receive new spiritual life from God. This is the heart 
of the gospel, which just means good news. Anyone can receive that new life of God simply by looking at and trusting in the crucified Jesus. This is how Romans 3, 22 to 25 puts it. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of sin. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. You see, the blood of Jesus is not like yours or mine. Because of what Adam did, we are all polluted by the poison of sin. And our blood couldn't be shed to pay for the wrongs of someone else. But because Jesus never committed a sin, never once disobeyed the commands of God, his blood has the power to set us free from sin forever. We don't escape sin's power just by trying to be better people. We don't try we don't escape sin's power by trying to morally reform ourselves or become more religious or attend more meetings or pray more prayers. We simply look at the crucified Saviour and trust in what he has done. Only that can bring true freedom from sin's power. This is how we receive God's new life. John 3.16 goes on to say, For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not die, but have everlasting life. There are two things we can do to respond to what we've heard this morning. I'm going to pray in a moment. If you've never yourself made that decision to trust in the crucified Saviour, to realise that that's all you need to do. There is nothing else but to look and to trust. If you've never done that, this morning, today, is your opportunity. We're going to pray in a moment and you can begin a new life with God today. But secondly, if you're already a follower of Jesus, God is calling you to turn away if you've had a life of complaining and grumbling, if you know that your heart is filled with ungratefulness towards God and doubting his promises, today's the day when you can turn away from that and begin a life of gratitude towards God, of remembering his goodness towards you. He's offering you that opportunity today. So let's take a moment to pray. First, if you've never chosen to put your trust in Jesus crucified, let's pray. Dear Father God, forgive me for all my sins. I recognize before you that I'm not going to become a better person simply by trying harder or doing more or becoming more religious. Only you, hanging on that cross, have the power to break the power of sin over me. Father, I acknowledge the death of Jesus is what brings my forgiveness. I choose to trust in him and him alone. And I ask you to forgive me and to give me new life from above. New life by the power of your spirit. Help me know 
that I am forgiven and that I have become a child of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now, if you've had a habit of complaining and ungratefulness, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you that you see all hearts and know all hearts. Nothing's hidden from you. Father, I admit my habit of complaining and grumbling against you and against the leaders you've appointed. I bring these things to you and I ask your forgiveness, Father. Help me to believe your character, compassionate, merciful, slow to get angry, full of unfailing love, showing mercy to thousands and not treating us as our sins deserve. Father, help me to be thankful and grateful. Help me to cultivate a life of thanksgiving and praise in place of complaining and grumbling. Thank you that you can do this through the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless each one of you this week and give you the power to keep following him. Amen.